I'm very happy to be here. And as Chad said, I'm with the American Sheep Industry Association. And for me, one of the best things is being able to walk outside in the morning and getting to see this. A couple of bouncing lambs running around and your ewes sitting there waiting for you. It's just a great way to start your morning. Um, and it's really uh, rewarding to be able to provide a good life for these animals. And then in return, they share with you a companionship, meat, uh, milk and dairy products, and then can also share their wool with you. Um, so really a great way for both of you. There you go. And so as we go through our talk today, I'd like you to focus on what would you like to do with your animals? So are you interested in more of the meat side or um, more of the companion side, or maybe the dairy and milk or uh, the wool? And so today we're gonna to be focusing on the wool side, but know that most of this can apply to any species, whether it's the goats and mohair and cashmere or also llamas and alpacas. So most of this can apply to any of them, but today we'll focus on the sheep. And so I'm a mom. Um, so Chad asked me if, uh, if I wanted to add anything else and you guys will find out a little bit more about me through this, um, but I'm a mom and I'm always running around with my toddlers and my kids um, around the ranch. And then I also work for a professional organization. So wool fits really well into my lifestyle and likely yours as well. Um, so it's really great for uh, just running around, being athletic and outside, um, moving around, uh, super comfortable clothing that can help with moisture and sweating, as well as odor management, and then can also provide UV protection. Um, so really great as you're moving around. And then also just as um, more of a lifestyle thing, having it safe for your family, so it's natural and sustainable. And then flame resistant, I mean, that's something we don't usually think about, um, but for pajamas or carpeting in your house, having something that's flame resistant that isn't going to catch on fire as easily can be really important, just a nice safety feature, um, as well as being natural. Um, and then also uh, going to work, uh, looking nice when we need to, it shows really brilliant colors and has really nice draping effects. So a lot of fashion industries use wool. Um, so it uh, definitely fits great into my lifestyle and likely fits well into yours. So you might want to consider wool. And there are lots of different breeds of sheep. So here we see there's some wool breeds, which we'll be focusing on today, as well as some meat breeds. And these sheep also produce wool, but it's not as high quality as the wool breeds. They're more designed for their meat. And then you also have hair sheep. And so these sheep, uh, shed their hair. They don't have wool, so they shed that hair and they don't need to be shorn often. Um, so it's really great if you uh, are lacking shears or just aren't interested in the wool side, the hair sheep can be a great um, choice for you. And then there are also dairy breeds for that milk and cheese side. And then lots of other breeds that uh, you can look into. There's a lot of them. And so within the wool breeds specifically, we see that there's fine wool breeds, um, more dual purpose, these are the medium type wool breeds, and then long coarse wool breeds. When we're talking about each of those, we're actually talking about the fibers. So this is wool, and each of these fibers, you can see a strand of fiber here, and if it's super fine for wool, then we'll call that more of the fine wool. If it's super coarse, it'll be the coarse long wool, and then you can have anywhere in the middle, which tends to be more of the me uh, medium type wool breeds. And for these, that fine wool is usually going to be used for the close to skin garments. So ones that uh, you, you don't want super, super scratchy against your skin. Um, so something fine like Merino or Rambouillet will be really nice to your skin and then provide all those benefits we talked about earlier. Medium wool is great for something that's going to be a little bit farther away from your skin, but certainly something that you can still wear. So something like socks, cardigans, blankets, very insulating, um, but uh, maybe not quite as close to your skin. Coarse wool is great for rugs, upholstery. It's very durable. So oftentimes they'll use rugs in your house or in airplanes or in hotels because it is so durable. 
And then there's also the heritage breeds, which have a very, they can range a lot in what their fiber is like and what they're like. And so with these, you might think of something like the Navajo churro, which uh, oftentimes they use for the churro, the Navajo rugs. Um, and so, but then there's also other fine wools or sometimes they have fine and coarse or hair in them. So there's a great variety of heritage breeds. Um, and I love that picture of the baby because wool is uh, great for everybody in the family. And so we know a little bit about the different kinds of wool now. So let's focus on actually growing your wool. So it's important to start with good genetics. It's kind of like a car. If you have just a regular old car, no matter how much you fix it up and uh, clean it, it's never going to become a Ferrari. So it's the same way with genetics. If you, you need to have a good base, a good start, so that you can have a good quality product in the end. You can't take something that's really poor genetics and make it great. Um, so when we're actually looking at the wool, we're going to talk about staple length. So something, this is a year's worth of growth on this fleece. And so how long that wool is. Sometimes it's three inches, four inches. That's generally the range that we want to be in for a year's worth of growth for most breeds, especially fine and medium type breeds. So that staple length is important. If it's too short, then it's going to be really hard to process it into an actual item. Um, so having something in that three to four inch range is good. And then having something that's heavy and dense is important. Um, if we have a sheep that produces 10 pounds of wool, it's a lot better than the sheep that's only producing two pounds of wool. It's just providing us with a lot more uh, the product. And then also having it uniform. So we want it uniform across that fleece in terms of the fiber diameter, so that fine or coarseness, as well as the character and staple length, so uniform fleece. And character, we're talking about if it's a white fleece, how bright and white it is. So we want color, crimp. So the zigzags that you can see in the wool here, that's the crimp. And that adds elasticity to the final product. And so it's really important with our yarn or any kind of, uh, especially knitted items. Um, and so having good uh, crimp in our fleece is good. Um, and then handle. So that's how soft the fleece is. So we just want a nice soft fleece. And so once we have that good baseline, starting with a good base, we're going to manage our sheep well. And so I think we're going to talk next about good management, maybe a little bit. And then uh, that's just good for the animal, important for their health and care, as well as the wool. Having a good uh, management program is going to help create a strong fleece. So sometimes if we, they are lacking nutrients or putting energy elsewhere, not into their wool, then there will be a break or make the wool tender. And so in one spot in the wool across the whole fleece, it'll be weak in that fiber. And so that's going to separate when you're processing it and make it uh, really inconsistent products and make it hard to process. So we have good sheep management. And then one of the most important things we think of, um, especially with if it's going into the niche markets is keeping the wool clean. And that is so important to keep the wool clean and not have any contaminants, which is anything that's not wool, um, because it affects that processing and then the end products. So if it goes into processing, it's really hard to get it out later on. It's very costly if it can even be get, gotten out later on. And so these are some examples of contaminants. So uh, manure, we don't really want that. It'll most likely scour out. So it's maybe the uh, least troublesome of all of these. This in the bottom left-hand corner is vegetable matter. And so that's hay and chaff, any kind of vegetation. And especially when they're small like that, they get really uh, entwined with the fibers and it's really hard to remove that during processing. The middle picture one, it's a little bit hard to see, but if you look closely, you can see thicker fibers in it, and that is actually hair. And so when that's a problem for two reasons. One of them is that is going to, if it's in your sweater, say, it's going to be a lot coarser and create more prickle on your skin. So it's going to feel itchy. And so you don't want that, especially something like a sweater or cardigan. 
And then the second reason is that hair take or shows dye differently than the rest and then true wool fibers do. So it's not, you're gonna notice those hair fibers in your sweater or rug or blanket. The last picture on the right hand side is actually baling twines from a bale of hay. And that during processing will separate and all of those fibers will get entwined with the rest of the wool. And if you want it out, you'll have to actually go through and pick those each individual orange fiber out. Um, and if it's all the way to the cloth stage, you're gonna have to pick it out. And sometimes it's hard, like in the last picture of the yarn we saw, um, it's, uh, if it gets entwined in the yarn or in the fabric, it's really hard to get out. And it's almost so much so that you ruin the yarn in that spot. And so you can see all of these little pieces here are actually plastic bits that got entwined with the yarn and are essentially there forever now. So keeping the wool clean is really important. So we have our good base with genetics. We've uh, managed our sheep well, we've kept it clean, and now we need to shear it. And shearing is really critical for animal health. It helps them regulate their body temperature um, so especially in the summer, we know if we have a whole bunch of wool on that's hot, um, it can also help keep uh, manure away from them. It helps lambs nurse better. So for a lot of reasons, it's really critical to the animal's health. We need to do it every year. And so we usually, for most breeds, we'll do it one time per year, usually right before lambing. If it's a coarse breed or a heritage breed, sometimes we'll do it two times a year because it ends up so long, they can produce so much wool in that year that it ends up too long of a fiber otherwise. And if you're looking for a shear, you can find that on the ASI website. There's a great contact list there. And then it's important with shearing. Um, so you've organized your shear, you have them coming. And so uh, we want to make sure that we're ready now. So ahead of time, we want to have our sheep penned um, in a pen easy to get to. We want to make sure that the wool is dry. And then we wanna fast the sheep overnight. So when they shear the sheep, they put them on their rump so that they can shear their belly. And most sheep again are sheared right before lambing time. And so if they are sitting on their rump, it's put and they have a belly full of hay and water, it's putting a lot of pressure on their fetus. Um, it's just making the sheep really uncomfortable. So the, for the sheep's comfort even, as well as the shearers, it's good to fast them overnight. And then having your area ready. Uh, a lot of times, uh, two pieces of plywood laid down on the ground can act as a nice shearing floor so you can keep the wool clean as it comes off. Um, and then having electricity and good lighting nearby is important. And then after the wool comes off of the sheep, we're gonna be handling the wool. And so what I will call this skirting. So skirting is removing anything that's not wool and that is inferior wool. So we want a good fleece um, to come off here. And so we're gonna take out any uh, contamination, dingleberries, um, and then anything that is super short or inferior wool in some way. So super short wool, anything that's damaged, the belly wool will come off separately. And this is going to help make a more uniform, better product. If you have a whole bunch of sheep, or if you're combining your wool with another lot to make a bigger lot, then you can class it. And that's just combining similar wools. So you're taking a bunch of different fleeces that are similar and putting them together to make that bigger lot. So we have a nice fleece now that we've skirted. And now we have the option that we can either sell it raw if you're interested in selling it, or you can process it at home or in a mill. And if you process it at home, um, it, a lot of people really enjoy it, it can be very rewarding, uh, but it does take a lot of work and time. It has to go through a lot of different stages to get to a uh, final product. If it's going through a mill, um, it's certainly maybe more easy, um, but it does cost more because you are, it does have to go through so many stages to get to a product. And some of those product options, again, you can keep it as a raw wool if you want to sell it that way. You can make it into roving or top. So that's what this the top picture is. The wool has been scoured, it's been washed and dried, and now it's been combed or carded 
So those fibers are more aligned and straightened with each other. So it makes this nice, smooth, um, massive fibers. And if you take that and elongate all those fibers, stretch them out, you and then add twist, spin to it, then you're spinning the yarn and making it, or spinning the roving or top and making it into yarn. And so you can sell um, this roving or top, especially to fiber artists, they enjoy it. You can keep it yourself and turn it into yarn or you can sell yarn. You can also sell woven items, uh, things like blankets. And then you can also sell or make for yourself knitted items, knitted crocheted items, either on a knitting machine or by hand. And then you also have the option of selling felted items. So in the bottom picture, you see these little balls, the little colorful balls, and those are dryer balls. And so um, if you're working with wool, you'll quickly find that you always have some leftover wool. And so making these dryer balls is a great way to get rid of that extra wool, especially some lower quality wool. Um, they're kind of fun to make and uh, definitely great for your clothes in the dryer. And then some marketing always. So you can certainly keep the wool and use it yourself, which is great. Um, but unless you are not breeding your animals, you will quickly find that you have more wool than you know what to do with. Uh, so remember that sheep produces, you're getting a new fleece every year off of each one of those sheep. Um, and especially if you're breeding them, you're gonna have a lot of wool. Uh, so having some marketing outlets is a great option. Um, you can sell it directly to the buyers, whoever that may be. You might be able to sell it to the mill. Sometimes they're interested in buying wool and then they'll process it and sell the final products. There's also lots of fairs and festivals around the country. And so uh, general fairs and festivals, as well as ones that are specifically for fiber artists and fiber uh, animals. And then also on websites. So here's a website where they're selling wool as well as meat. And you can even reserve it ahead of time because it's in such high demand um, for them. Other places like Etsy and eBay can be good options sometimes on social media, and then also farmer's markets. And with farmer's markets, I would uh, direct you towards pro providing more of the yarn or finished products. Most people, general public at a farmer's market don't necessarily know how to wash or spin the wool. And so providing them with some yarn or um, a blanket could be a good option. And so this is a lot of information. So I'm sure you're wondering, where do I go from here? How do I get started? Uh, and so the biggest, best advice I can give is to get connected. Um, get to know people in your area that are doing something similar that you want to do. I remember keeping that question in mind, what do I want to do with my animals? Um, get connected with people who are doing something that you want to do with yours. And you can learn a lot from them, more like mentors. Um, and if you don't know anybody in your area, Sometimes your state uh, sheep specialist can help with that or your local extension office can help as well as veterinarians. They work with a lot of different clients and can match you up with a good mentor. Also, fairs and festivals can be a great place. A lot of them have sheep shows. And so uh, going and being able to look at the sheep, listening to someone judge those sheep and finding out what they're looking for and then being able to talk to the breeders is great. And a lot of specifically fiber fairs and festivals will have a wool show where you can go and actually listen to the judging and hear uh, more about wool and see what that judge is looking for, what is good about the different wools. And then there's also a lot of online and in-person classes that you can go to, whether that, uh, especially online webinars and such. And I also was part of the online. Um, I encourage you to go to sheepusa.org. There's a lot of great resources on there for wool and sheep. Um, and then also on the YouTube channel for them um, is some great webinars. So again, just uh, think about what you would like to do with your animals. And I hope this inspired you to think about some wool and how you might like to use it. <laughs>